And I set about doing this by doing a search for all the different kinds of teaching tools that are available, but using three sets of ethical criteria to figure out what the... Um, I, I did these ethical criteria basically to try and figure out, is there a way to teach biology, but in a way that gets these students actually solving the biggest problems out there right now? I call this first set of ethical criteria the criteria of maximum benefit to societal infrastructure. All societies need food, water, shelter, a healthy ecosystem, a healthy economy, and a healthy community. Many of the problems we have today are because one of these elements of societal infrastructure isn't working quite so well. So I wanted to try to find teaching tools that would directly address these. The other set of teaching tools I was interested in finding fall into the ethical category of maximum availability to the greatest number of people. The reason was this. I wanted students to engage with these learning activities in the classroom, but then be able to take them home and deploy those in their neighborhoods and in their homes. So I was looking for teaching tools that were inexpensive, didn't take up a lot of time, didn't take up a lot of space, that were fun, that were safe, that were creative. And finally, I wanted to find teaching tools that engage students in the problem-solving cycle of defining a problem, trying to formulate a solution, trying the solution, failing at it, reformulating it, and then eventually succeeding. Now, that's a lot of ethical criteria, and some of you may be thinking, gosh, did he find anything that can, can line up to that? Well, the answer is yes. Many of them fall within the category of what we call um, appropriate technology. In the 1970s, a term called appropriate technology was coined, and I'm going to explain sort of what that is based upon these, these uh, teaching tools I found. The first one is vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is a soil-generating engine. It combines worms with soil microorganisms, it transmutes your garbage and your paper waste into soil. I really like this system because you can teach almost all of biology out of a compost pile. Cellular respiration, photosynthesis, genetics, biochemistry, all of it's happening, all of it's apparent in one of these systems. But also, worldwide, especially in arid lands, we have a lot of soil erosion. So if you can teach somebody to build soil, you're countervailing that. That's an example of appropriate technology. Another one is something we should all be doing in a place like El Paso, uh, you can count on two hands the number of days that you wouldn't be able to use this. It's so sunny here. Uh, it's solar cooking, passive solar energy. I really like solar cooking because most of my students don't have a lot of culinary experience. And if you can piggyback a culinary lesson on top of a biochemistry lesson, you've doubled the value of that lesson, and you've done the students a favor. One of my favorites for arid land agriculture is something called Oya irrigation. Oyas are fired but unglazed clay pots. You bury them in the soil down to their neck, you pour water in them, and because they're unglazed, they slowly weep water into the soil around them, delivering the water directly to the roots of the plants where the plants need it. In deserts, it's not so much how much water falls on the land that matters. What matters most is how much of that water you were able to capture, store, and then give to the plants that need it most at the right times. Another one is, I call it beet green gardening. Have you ever noticed at the grocery store how the beets have little tiny green leaves around the top of them? That's because they want you to rescue them. So do it. Go to the grocery store, get a couple of beets, Bring them home, put them in a pot about halfway down, spill some water over them, and watch them seize their second chance at life. This almost never fails. Within five weeks, you can take a bucket with six beets to be in a bucket with six beets with a forest of beet greens above it, and you can go with salad scissors, you can snip off some of the greens, use them in your cooking, and they'll just keep growing you more beet greens. It's, it almost never fails, and it's so simple, and I really, really like this system because it taught me that students can learn more biology by keeping something alive than they can by reading about life. 
And I think it's because so many of the students today don't have a lot of experience outside interacting with things that live outside. This gives them that, and it gives them a concept uh, to match with what they're reading in a textbook. Now, there are many others of these, of these things, and I'm not going to talk uh, so extensively about them, but I'm going to list them and show you a picture, and just know these are things that we've been able to do in an arid land community college. They could also be done in a high school. They're fun, and they fit many of the criteria that I outlined before. Arid land food dehydration. Our air is so dry, it sucks the water right out of thinly sliced fruit. You couldn't get away with this in Houston, but in a place like El Paso, it works every time. Making sauerkraut. Making kefir. Kefir is a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. It floats in milk, and it ferments it into the probiotic beverage that we know as kefir. A similar life form is kombucha. This floats in tea and turns it into vinegar. Feeding hummingbirds. Feeding black soldier flies. Black soldier flies are a kind of fly that does not feed as adults, so they're not a pest to people. But as larvae, they are unbelievably voracious. And you can feed them to chickens, or you can feed them to fish in an aquaponics unit. Hyperthermic composting. Growing shiitake mushrooms. Making seed balls, sprouting seeds, growing plants in self-watering planters, planting trees, cooking with parabolic solar cookers, and even participating in sustainability events like uh, master planning for the city. Now, I think there are three major lessons that I've learned that I'd like to convey to you, because I think they apply to all of us. One has to do with education. One has to do with how these tools work in relation to us in the world. And one of them has to do with how our personal lives and our jobs relate to the problems of the world. Educationally, I've learned that it is possible to build an entire science curriculum on the foundation of creative problem solving which in turn is based upon maximum accessibility to the greatest number of people in a local community, which in turn is based upon the foundation of creating value for societal infrastructure. Not only is this possible, but if you do this, it turns your classroom into an engine for the generation of benefit in your local community. Another thing I learned is that these technologies truly are amazing. They save a lot of resources, they produce great products, but the greatest benefit is not what they save and it's not what they produce. It's what they make of you to have partnered with them. What I mean is this. These technologies are the fastest and strongest first step from being a consumer in society to being a producer in society a producer of valuable things that are solving problems. And finally, I've learned that you can look squarely at the world and all of its problems. You can look at your job and your personal life and all of the ways that your job and personal life are not delivering to solve the needs of the world. And you can painstakingly, using a lot of effort, a lot of teamwork, a lot of creativity, applying ethics, applying research, you can line up the productivity of your personal life and your job with the needs of the world. And that's what the world needs now. Thank you. <laughs>